Hi, everyone. Let me know if you can't, raise your hand if you can't hear me OK at any point. I'm not used to <laughs> lecturing in front of an audience. This is a little different for me. Um, yeah, so I cover, as Les said, I cover energy and environment for Vermont Digger. So we call it the environmental beat. Um, and I'm going to you know, talk to you a little bit today about all the different things I get to do for work. That is a photo of me interviewing an engineer on a boat in Lake Carmi. So sometimes I get to do fun stuff and go outside. <laughs> Um, okay, let's see. Okay, so how did I get here? I, I actually don't have a master's. <laughs> I have a Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Studies from the University of Vermont. I graduated in 2013. Um, I also have a minor in Spanish. And one of the cooler things I did when I was in college that I recommend you know people do if, if they have the opportunity and are able to was I studied abroad in Chile and you know that was Part of the reason I wanted to minor in Spanish was to get to study abroad. And I got to do a research project at the end of that experience where I lived with a group of women farmers in rural Chile for three weeks. That ended up, ended up kind of forming the basis of my thesis. And doing that project, most of it um, was focused on interviewing women. And it was really more like a, a sociology project. But that, as I look back on it, I think you know I developed some of the skills that I use today as a journalist doing that research project. So kind of a highlight from my college time. Um, so one thing Les said was in, when I was communicating with him was um, you know, he wanted speakers to talk a little bit about how they got to where they are now, to their career. I did not study journalism. And I had about, let's see, one, two, three, seven or eight different jobs before I became a journalist <laughs> after college. Um, yeah, I worked as a bee researcher, school garden educator. That's a picture of me when I worked on a trail crew. So I graduated from school and didn't really know what I wanted to do and tried out a bunch of different things. Um, and the way I got my current job at Vermont Digger was I'd written for my high school paper and had always you know, loved writing, was pretty good at writing, always interested in it. But um, when I was in college, you know, I decided I wanted to focus more on environmental studies and do that route. But eventually I came back into writing because of my interest, got an internship at Vermont Digger. Um, and then five months later, they hired me as the energy environment reporter. So I had a pretty meandering path to get to where I am today. So it's OK if you don't know exactly what you want to do in college. Um, OK, so what do I do as a reporter? And day, every day is a little bit different. But I'll, the you know, so the bulk of what I do is interview people. And Vermont Digger, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with Vermont Digger, but it's an online daily news site. We're based in Montpelier. So we do a lot of coverage of the, the legislature and the state house, you know, covering state government. Um, I cover all of that with the energy and environment lens. So that's kind of, you know, my focus area. And so I get to interview politicians. Um, a couple weeks ago, I got to interview the governor. That was kind of a cool thing. Uh, interview you know other state officials like the head of the state agency of natural resources. I talk to lawmakers, um, heads of environmental nonprofits. I talk to people involved in the um, energy utility world, researchers, and local residents. So I get to talk to I probably every day would say I interview at least two to three people, sometimes more. So a lot of that's over the phone. Some of it's in person. Kind of depends on the story. Um, another major component of my work is doing research, whether it's you know just looking stuff up online, or sometimes I'll actually file public records requests to try to get access to public documents. Um, also, you know, spend time reading reports. Sometimes my articles are about you know a new report that came out. Um, yeah, and so based off that, I write three to five short stories a week, so a, lo a lot of writing. <laughs> and then I also get to work on longer projects, like a few weeks ago, I did a series about climate change. So that was something where my editors were nice and let me actually work on that you know, for a few weeks, didn't have to do daily stories, and then put out a five-part series. And then the other main component of my job is sometimes I get to go on the radio. Um, we have a podcast. So I'll, I don't make the podcast, but I will work with the guy who produces the podcast to do um, one about an environmental issue. And then also. I got to go on TV on Vermont this week, this summer, and which is like our talk show. So I get to do some fun stuff sometimes as a print journalist. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So energy. This is kind of just an overview of um, some Vermont energy and environment issues that I cover a lot. So this probably wouldn't surprise anyone, but water quality um, is a big issue. You know, so. 
phosphorus pollution into Lake Champlain. Also another big issue that I'll talk more about later is PFOA contamination, which is a chemical that's kind of, it's, it's phased out by industry now, but it's emerging as um, something of concern all around the country. And Vermont had PFOA contamination issues in Bennington, which is in the southern part of the state. I'll talk more about that later, but um, climate change, obviously, renewable energy development, a lot of that now, a few years ago, wind was kind of the big, I guess, point of tension or area development in Vermont. Now, solar is um, becoming a lot more of a hot topic. So I cover a lot of that. Um, also the, oops, I got cut off. The state's energy utilities, so electricity, and if you guys have heard of Green Mountain Power, that's the state's biggest utility. I cover them a lot. They have you know, a rate increase or a proposed project, how it could impact residents. Also, um, Vermont Gas, which had this controversial pipeline in Addison County. There was a lot of, a couple of years ago, um, there was a lot of sort of fighting over that, and so that made for good news stories. Um, also, conservation and biodiversity, that can include invasive species, like I don't know if you guys know about the emerald ash borer, um, that's kind of an emerging topic of concern. Also, I wrote an article, I think it was last year, about how the state was, was basically losing half of, um, half of the state's bumblebee species were in decline or completely gone. So that was something, you know, that was very Vermont specific research that I wrote about. Also, um, waste management, whether it's recycling. Um, another a big issue I've covered that I'll talk more about is the expansion of the Coventry landfill in the northern part of the state. And also, you know, any energy and environment bills in the state house. So that's, and the legislature runs from January through May, so during that time period, Vermont Digger really focuses its efforts on covering what's going on in the state house so people know what their lawmakers are up to. Um, okay, so, I, the way I'll take questions is if anyone, I'll pause after each section and if there are any questions, I can answer a couple and then move on. So I don't know if anyone has any questions yet, but maybe not. <laughs> okay. And yeah, so I figured I'll talk about a few kind of ongoing stories that I've covered and you know how I found out about them, what some of the different developments are, you know, tools, how I reported them, just to give you a taste of what it's like to be an energy and environment reporter. Um, all right, so this is, um, yeah, that's a photo of a truck dumping trash at the Coventry landfill, um, which is one of the, probably one of the biggest ongoing stories that I've covered. I think I've written over 15 stories about it and on a podcast. And so um, the Coventry landfill, which is in Northern Vermont, it's about, I think it's like an hour northeast of Johnson, pretty near the border with Canada, just south of Newport. Um, it is 78 acres in size, and last, I think it was last spring, so spring of 2018, Casella Waste Systems, which is a big, you know, trash and recycling company, they kind of do like all aspects of waste management. Um, they're the ones who own it. And so they had applied for a 51 acre expansion of the landfill. And they kind of said, you know, this is a really crucial part of waste management in Vermont. Even if we do more recycling and composting, people still generate trash. And if the, if the landfill weren't expanded, it would have run out of room in about four years. Um, and with the expansion, it could, they could put trash in there for an additional 25 years. Um, state regulators said, you know, their application was complying with environmental rules, so they didn't really have any reason to deny it. But there was some opposition from local residents, as you might imagine. And then, okay, so, and the way I found out about this story, um, it actually wasn't as, you might think, oh, this is, so this is Vermont's last remaining landfill. But I realized no one really, outside of that region and in the waste management world, people didn't really know about this landfill. Like no one I knew in Montpelier where I live had any idea where their trash went to. Um, so I, I found out about this a couple months into the job. So I think it was like May of 2018. I was doing an interview for a different story about a landfill in Moortown, which is near Montpelier, that had closed. And I was talking with someone from the state and the guy kind of in an offhand way told me, oh, you know, by the way, the Coventry landfill is up for a 51 acre expansion. And I thought, huh, I don't know a ton about landfills. That sounds pretty big. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's something I could imagine people, landfills are something that typically it's sort of a non-my-backyard thing. A lot of people don't want 
huge landfill expanding right next to them for re reasons you might be able to imagine. Um, so that kind of flagged my interest, and I asked him if he could put me on a list to receive updates about the application, um, which is actually like something that's really important in my job, is just asking people to put me on mailing lists so I know when things happen. <laughs> And so you know that I, I ended up doing a story once the state kind of gave a draft approval of it, and that was last I think it was last June, June of 2018. And then I attended shortly after that. I went to a public meeting up in the town of Coventry about the expansion because I wanted you know I wanted the reason I drove up there was I wanted to see what do people think about this expansion? Are they opposed to it? Do they support it? You know I have no idea, um, and it's really important. As a reporter, I don't want to just rely on, I have to rely on my hunches to a degree, but you always want to kind of you know, ground truth that and see what people are actually, residents are actually thinking. So I went to this meeting. Sure enough, there, most of the people who spoke did express opposition. Um, some of their main concerns were odor complaints, um, also just, you know, just kind of the unsightly nature of it. One guy kept calling it Mount Casella because it had gotten so tall over the years. Um, you know, just and also just concerns about like how is this going to impact my property value, and then the other main concern is that it's right by Le Lake Memphremagog, which is a pretty big lake um, that sits. It's actually mostly in Canada, but part of it's in Vermont as well. So people were just saying, you know, we shouldn't really have this mega landfill right by a, what is a drinking water supply for almost 200,000 Canadians. Um, so it turns out my instinct kind of was right that there was some concern about this expansion. So some of the developments, um, like I said, this was kind of, so, you know, sometimes we write stories that are almost just a one-off story, like something, you know, someone gets, I don't know, fined for polluting, and then they clean it up, and it's not really a big deal. But this is the type of story where, you know, there was this ongoing kind of opposition to it, ongoing approval processes by the state. So it's something that I kept tabs on, would kind of do an update on whenever anything interesting would happen. Um, so in... And so this is just like a smattering of some of the things I wrote about. In last July, this Quebec lawmaker, he was like a member of parliament, had sent a strongly worded letter to our governor and some other state officials urging them to deny the landfill expansion. And that was kind of interesting. I actually found out about that by, I was trying to figure out whether Canadians opposed it because it is, um, it's not that far from Canada and it's also close to that lake that provides a lot of drinking water for them. So I initially found a French article, <laughs> and I don't read French, so I, I was you know, trying to, I read Spanish, I was trying to decipher it, and I put it in Google Translate, and I was like, okay, I think this seems to be, this guy seems to be opposing this. <laughs> um, and then I you know, managed to call their office, and thankfully they also spoke English, so I did an interview with him, but that was kind of a fun experience. Um, and then, let's see, the state gave their draft approval like another, some kind of other, and it was a draft permit in August, so I just you know, wrote a pretty straight story about that so people would just know about it. And then in September, there was a very heated public meeting about it. And so the first meeting I'd gone to had, I don't know, maybe 40 people or so. So it was reasonably well attended, but not huge. This meeting had probably 250 people there. And part of the reason I think that there were so many people there, this, this group that opposed it, who had the acronym DUMP, had you know raised awareness about it, um, but I'd also been writing a lot of stories about it, and some people came up to me and said, you know, I found out about this issue from reading your stories, which was kind of interesting, um, which is why it's also important, I think, to just try to shed light on things and let people know, like, hey, this landfill is expanding. You know, not that I'm trying to like sway anyone's opinion about it, but just want to draw attention to matters. That's an important part of journalism. Um, yeah, so I was in September. Then the state gave their kind of their final approval of this per, of um, yeah of the expansion, and some local residents ended up actually appealing it in the environmental court. That's kind of still ongoing. Um, so you know I read about both those things. And then finally in November, I've been trying to ask Casella for some time if I could tour the landfill, and they were you know they were always very nice about getting back to my questions, even though I I did write some sort of hard articles, <laughs> and it kept, but I kept, um, wasn't that they would deny giving me a tour, it just kept not actually happening. <laughs> so finally, after months and months of trying to get that to happen, um, they were, you know, granted me a tour in November, so I went up with our 
the guy who's our photographer and podcast producer, and I interviewed one of their vice presidents, then we drove around the landfill, got some pictures, um, and you know, I think it was a good, I also wanted to give them the opportunity to sort of explain all the, all the protections they have in place, like double lining, how they collect um, this thing called leachate, which is colloquially known as garbage juice, and it's basically water that runs through the landfill and gets contaminated with all those nice chemicals in there. Um, you know, so it gave them the opportunity to sort of talk about, this is why we think this is safe and protective of the environment. Um, but also gave me the opportunity to you know, get good photos and kind of learn more about it, so that was good. And I also used that trip as a time to meet with some of the residents who oppose the landfill expansion in person. Um, I do a lot of my interviews over the phone, but I think, especially if I'm covering an issue a lot or it's kind of controversial, I really like to go and actually you know, meet people and sort of see them whatever, in their home or in you know, their school or workplace, and I just think it, it adds more to stories. Yeah, and then, so that was kind of like, I guess the last big thing was July 2019. It received its Act 250 permit, and Act, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with Act 250, but it's Vermont's land use law, and a lot of major, I think it's like t a subdivision with 10 or more houses, and a lot of other major commercial activities have to get approval from this, so. Um, and that was kind of a big hurdle for the landfill to clear. So aside from this ongoing appeal, it's, it's probably going to end up, um, you know, going forward. And, but yeah, there was a lot of active local resistance. You know, they filed a lawsuit against it. So it was kind of a, a really interesting issue to cover. And then just one other, this is kind of one specific story I did was about, so like I said, a lot of the issues that people who live by the landfill had were centered around odor complaints, um, which you know isn't shocking. And but it kind of related to that. Something that they would say was, you know, so for Casella to actually get, Casella has to have a, one, one, you know, one of the many th approvals it has is a, a sort of an odor permit, or I forget what it's called exactly. But basically, they can't. They're not supposed to have bad odors go off site, which. If you, you know, if obviously residents were kind of complaining about that, so it seems like, all right, what's going on here? Um, and something that I found out talking to state regulators was that, so they're, you know, they're based in Montpelier, um, and residents would complain a lot that, well, you guys don't get up here enough. You know, it's, it, it takes you too long to get up here to actually be able to see, is this, you know, smelling by my house? Is it not? And then the landfill operator can only get a violation if someone from the state or the company detects an odor. So basically people were saying, we feel like you know, there's a lot of issues that just aren't really getting documented or aren't actually being investigated in a timely fashion. Um, so I wanted to look into that more. So I filed a public records request with the State Agency of Natural Resources and received a lot of PDFs of odor complaints. So I remember getting, <laughs> getting a zip file and opening it and being like, ooh, this is, <laughs> how am I gonna look through all this? Thankfully we had a, I have a data reporter, so he was able to kind of put all the important information in a spreadsheet. And once we did that, we realized that there was this huge spike in odor complaints in 2018. I think there was 37 that year. 2017, there'd been two. 2016, there'd been zero. So we're like, okay, what you know, what's going on here? Um, and so to kind of figure out, you know, what's actually happening, I talked to some of the residents who'd filed odor complaints. I talked to state regulators, and I talked to Casella. And everyone pretty much agreed that it wasn't necessarily that the smell had been getting worse, <laughs> but it was more that, um, you know, residents were saying, well, now we're more aware of actually how to file these properly, because there had been a lot more, I guess, just awareness of the landfill in general with the expansion. Um, and then Casella was kind of, you know, kind of said a slimmer thing, but they also went as far as to say that it was a, a tactic by opponents of the landfill expansion, and they were kind of claiming, I didn't quite say this, but the gist was that you know, people weren't actually smelling stuff or they were just trying to call the state because they were annoyed about the expansion. Um, whereas again, the residents were like, no, that's not it. It's just that we didn't know how to do this before. We weren't aware that we could do this. Um, and then the state, you know, kind of said, oh, well, this is good. It shows that the complaint system is working. <laughs> so it was interesting to hear, yeah, everyone's kind of different answers around that. And of course, as a reporter, you know, it's my job. I just, I put all that in the article and, um, you know, and then, yeah, what else did I, okay, so I, yeah, I published a story in May of 2019, and I don't think this was necessarily at all because of my story, but in the final 
Act 250 permit that they received, one of the requirements was that um, Casella had to pay to have a full-time third-party odor monitor up there to kind of look into complaints more quickly. So that was interesting to see how, you know, and, and that was also something people had kind of made public comments in the Act 250 process asking for that, but that was interesting. So that's, yep. Yeah. Okay, so another major topic that I've covered, oh wait, I'm actually gonna pause. Does anyone have any questions about, yes? So, um, my name's Lily. Yeah. I visited the landfill back in, um, like, 2020, and they were like, okay. they were like, oh, you know, we have to go I'm glad you asked that question, because that was one of the things I meant to talk about and forgot. <laughs> um, I don't know that they ever did most of the garbage from out of state, but what I've been told from both the company and the state, who they have to you know, report to, is that about 70% of Vermont's garbage goes there, and about a quarter of the trash the landfill receives is out of state, and they can only receive it kind of has to be approved on a case-by-case -case basis. Like, they can't just take your standard municipal out-of-state trash. Um, and that's because in some ways Vermont might have more stringent requirements than other states. But they can take, like, you know, construction debris or contaminated soils from other states. So that's what I've been told this, when I'm covering this, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to doubt. Uh, do they, is the country landfill capped for emissions? for a collection of like, methane? Yeah, so they, um, you guys are asking such good questions about things I forgot to bring up. So yeah, they um, collect, the methane actually, it does get collected and then it's actually used to generate electricity. Um, Washington Electric Co-op has a plant there. Is it just for on-site or is that? No, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's like connected to the grid, so it's not just for on-site, yeah. Anyone else have any questions? Okay. Um, okay, so PFAS contamination. Um, so PFAS stands for per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. Um, this has become, I think, I would say like a hot topic in environmental reporting nationwide in recent years. Um, so PFAS, there's, there's like 5,000 different compounds now. Two of the major ones that get a lot of attention, which are also the oldest ones, are PFOA and PFOS. Um, yeah, and so this kind of came to light in, I don't remember, sorry, let me just see what my next. Okay, yeah, I'll go here. Um, yeah, so PFOA was first developed by 3M in the 1940s, and it was used, started being widely used in the 50s to make Teflon, um, and then PFOS was kind of accidentally discovered by a 3M chemist, and it was used in Scotchgard, which is you know, something water repellent for clothing. So these started to be used you know, everywhere. Um, and they eventually, well, really starting in the 70s, um, even though this didn't come to light until much later, 3M scientists started to realize that these were accumulating in blood and possibly having health effects. However, they weren't actually, PFOA and PFOS were not phased out by the EPA until 2006. Um, so, and, and they also don't break down easily. That's part of what made them, I guess, so useful in the chemical engineering world, but that's also created a nightmare for drinking water supplies. And another major use of them was in this firefighting foam used on a lot of military bases and in, in training. And so that's ended up, um, there's a lot of drinking water contamination now by military bases from when that foam was used, because again, those chemicals don't break down. So even though, you know, there's even though they're not being used anymore, you know, they're still in drinking water. Um, so in Bennington in 2016, the state discovered that PFOA from an old there used to be a factory there that made Teflon coating, and it had basically contaminated drinking water of hundreds of Bennington residents. Um, so even though the factory, the factory closed in the early 2000s, but you know those those things don't break down that easily. So that was a you know major issue. Um, and then yeah, the other issue, like I said, there's over 5,000 of these compounds. So even though PFOA and PFOS have now been phased out, states are kind of trying to figure out 
what to do about the rest, particularly because the federal government isn't adequately <coughs> testing them, and the EPA, particularly under the Trump administration, hasn't exactly taken a leading role in addressing this crisis. So states like Vermont have really had to figure out, okay, what should you know, what's a safe level in drinking water for these compounds? Um, like the EPA only, I forget when it was, but not that long ago, they finally put out a health advisory of 70 parts per trillion for both PFOA and PFOS, but the state of Vermont did its own, is moving ahead with drinking water standards of 20 parts per trillion for five PFAS compounds, so a lot more strict. Um, and this is something that, yeah, states are just kind of all you know, doing their own thing with drinking water standards because there's no clear, there's not a lot of leadership from the federal government on this. So that's been a challenge. Um, yeah, so in Vermont, oh, I guess I go over a lot of that. Yeah, so um, like I said, state discovered PFOA contaminated wells in Bennington. Um, so after that, they started kind of doing other testing by areas where they, you know, former factories and things that might have led to contamination. So they found P PFOA contamination in drinking water by this wire coating facility in Pownall, Vermont, um, by an old landfill in Shaftesbury, near an old airport in Clarendon, Vermont, and also near the Burlington Airport because the Burlington Airports were the Vermont National Guard is stationed and they had used that that firefighting foam that had PFOA and PFOS in some, you know, to fight jet fuel fires. Um, yeah, and so, but a lot of the attention has been focused on Bennington because that's been by far the biggest, I guess like the most widespread contamination and where people had it in their drinking water. So between 2016 to 2019, the state ultimately ended up reaching a multi-million dollar settlement with St. Gobain. And St. Gobain is the company that, um, I think it was like in the early 2000s, purchased the chemical plant in Bennington. And then pretty quickly they shut it down in some ways, I think because they realized they were gonna have to, I think Vermont had stricter environmental laws than New Hampshire where the plant ended up being moved to. So that was kind of, so New Hampshire also is dealing with the similar issue once the plan was moved there, which is a shame. Um, yeah, so we wrote a lot of stories about, you know, the state reaching that settlement. Um, some of that was before, I didn't start working as a reporter at Digger until 2018. So a lot of the initial discovery was before my time, but it's a complicated issues like this. You know, the state, it, it takes years to negotiate payment for stuff. And, and their main, what they were really trying to get was the, for the company to pay for access to municipal drinking water for residents who had contaminated wells. And that was pretty expensive yeah. because they had to basically lay all these you know, miles and miles of pipes so that people could get access to the town drinking water. So it ended up costing, I forget how much, but I think it was like 40 million or something. Um, so it was a big settlement. But meanwhile, some residents of the area who had contaminated drinking water ended up filing their own uh, lawsuit with St. Gobain, so they were sued the company because they wanted them to pay for medical monitoring, which is basically where um, if you don't you know, already have a disease but have been exposed to something that has the potential to cause a disease, and PFOA is now uh, linked to causing a couple kinds of cancer, causing thyroid problems, so pretty serious issues. They wanted the company to pay for medical tests so they could see if they were going to develop any of these issues from the exposure. Um, and they also wanted them to pay property damages because they could no longer you know, use their drinking water on their property. Um, yeah, and so that is still going on. And that's something that I, I actually went down to court in Rutland one day into the federal court and covered that uh, a day of testimony. And that was kind of intense because St. Gobain had like 12 fancy New York lawyers. And <laughs> um, it was an interesting experience. And that's, that's still going on, but the, the judge in that case did grant their, so they wanted something called, they wanted to get class action status, which means that even though there was only, I think, it's like seven or eight people who actually sued the company, they wanted, if they win, they want it to apply to anyone who's exposed in that area to these chemicals. So that's what's called a class, class action lawsuit. And so the judge is allowing them the first hurdle they had to cross was having the judge allow them to move it forward as a class action lawsuit, which he did allow this summer. Um, but there's still like, you know, gonna be years and years of litigation ahead. Um, so that's something, you know, that's kind of an example of like an ongoing thing. Well, I just kind of keep tabs of and keep covering it to see if anything interesting happens. And the state also this year started 
um, released a plan for kind of widespread PFAS testing around the state and then also um, has been passing drinking water standards. That's something that I covered in the legislature, some of the debates about, you know, what should they be, um, especially with, again, with the federal government not leading on that. It's been a little bit, I think, tricky for Vermont. And then, yeah, one of the kind of more, I don't know, stories that I enjoyed working on for this was actually this summer I decided, I knew that the, um, the decision on the class action lawsuit was going to be coming soon. And I thought, you know, I kind of want to do, actually go down to Bennington and see how, you know, how, how is the state's response been? Do people, you know, they've all, because I'd, I'd kind of covered like the press conference where state um, officials had announced, oh, we've reached a settlement. It's a great day for Bennington. And I was like, well, I want to see what people down there actually <laughs> think about this. Like, you know, how, how is, um, how's the hookup to clean water been? Because only about half the town's been hooked up, and then the settlement they reached this year was for the remaining half. So there's still a lot of people who who still don't, you know, are drinking bottled water and um, have been for years. And so I, yeah, went down there, met with, and interviewed three different residents, two of whom are participating in the lawsuit. You know, kind of about why they decided to do it, what it's been like, um, what it's been like, you know, knowing that you were drinking contaminated water for for some of these. One of these people was at least 30 years, um, and not knowing, you know, what health impacts that might have in the long run, and yeah. So I mean, the story, like the hook for it, was kind of that this lawsuit was going on, but I just wanted to see, I don't know, how people were dealing with it. And then, yeah, I also met with two local politicians, um, and we made a podcast about that. So it was kind of an interesting reporting trip, and yeah. Um, any questions about? the PFAS issues, or PFOA, or Bennington. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, yeah, and this is, this is kind of a simpler story. <laughs> so I, this was a story I did about the agency of ag, the state agency of agriculture not publishing these required pesticide reports for five years. Um, so I found out about this by I was, I went to one day, I don't even know why, I, was, I think I was on this for another story about Vermont wanting to ban this kind of, it's called neonicotinoid pesticides, and they're known to have negative impacts to bees. So I was looking um, on the Agency of Ag website, and I came across this tab that said pesticide reports. So I was like, oh, this is relevant. Like, I wonder how many of these are currently used in Vermont. And I clicked on it, and it said, the data provided by Lowe are currently undergoing review if not, and have not been verified. And I was like, oh, that's great. And then I also saw the most recent year they had data from was 2013. <laughs> and I thought, huh, that's, you know, it's kind of a while ago now. Um, and then I, I also had heard, so that was a, when the, I found that out during the middle of the legislative session, which is a really busy time at my job. So I kind of put it on the follow up on this when you have time <laughs> to report on this, you know, list. And then a couple months later, I saw a Facebook post by an environmental group that was kind of, that basically said the Agency of Agriculture hasn't been publishing these mandatory reports in years, you know, they need to do it. And so I, and that, you know, piqued my interest again. And then, um, so I, the first thing I did was actually check in the law to make sure that this was something that was indeed required before I went and called them and said, hey, you guys haven't been publishing this thing that's required. Um, so, you know, I read through that. So some of what I do, I actually do end up doing some. I wouldn't exactly call it legal research, but I spend time, you know, looking at state laws and kind of how they're changing. And I also, you know, looked through the available data they did have just to kind of see what was there. And then the next step was actually interviewing the guy who's the head of the pesticide division about why these reports weren't there. Um, and I actually had to interview him a couple times because the first time he just kept saying that they had an IT problem, which I think was true, but I kept saying, yeah, okay, you had an IT problem, however, this has been five years <laughs> late, like shouldn't have this have been fixed by then? And finally, he also said, okay, and part of it is also that we've been devoting more resources to water quality and away from pesticides, which I think was really the kind of interesting answer there. But that was something where I, you know, I had to call this person back multiple times to try to just get them to actually say that. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I also did, just did some online research. There's a state pesticide advisory council. So looking through some of their documents, saw that they also had sent a, I think it was an email, but you know, kind of like a letter to the head of the agency of agriculture asking them to put more resources into this. So this made me think, 
you know, this isn't just a suspicion that I have. This is an issue that the Pesticide Advisory Council has asked for, which really sort of raises the level of it. Um, and then the last step, I you know, interviewed a couple of lawmakers who sit on, there's a Senate Agriculture Committee and a House Agriculture Committee to ask them if they knew about this, and neither of them did, which also, for me, that showed me, um, you know, these are pretty informed people who have Agency of Agriculture staff in a lot to talk to them about what's going on, and it's kind of interesting that the Agency of Ag hasn't ever brought this up as an issue or said, hey, maybe we need more resources to fix this, which sort of would seem to indicate that perhaps they weren't prioritizing it. Um, and also I talked to the guy who's in the environmental group who had you know, put the post on Facebook about his concerns and yeah, published a story. And I'm hoping soon maybe they'll <laughs> put the pesticide reports online. They said, they're, they said they now have shifted more resources to it and should have it done soon. So we'll see. <laughs> but. Uh, oh yeah, and then does anyone have any questions about that issue or pesticides in Vermont? Yeah. Yeah, my name is Russ Weiss, and um, thank you for staying those officials. <laughs> um, I was putting my garden to bed last weekend, and I noticed that my broccoli uh, plants had really I knew that they were overgrown. Yeah. And they were flower, and I was just about to pull them all out, and uh, a whole bunch of bumblebees were. Which made me very happy, so I let them in. Yeah. Is there anything we can do short of trying to get on state division heads to uh, promote their you know, reporting data as individuals to sort of help bumblebees? And yeah, that's a good... Um, I don't know that there's a simple answer to that because... So the that story I wrote um, that I was talking about earlier about the kind of decline in bumblebees in Vermont, researchers were saying there's, there's not like one sort of smoking gun thing that they can point to that caused that, but they, I mean, one of the things they did point to was pesticides, especially this kind called neonicotinoids. And Vermont actually this year banned residential use of that. Um, so it can still be used by commercial pesticide applicators, so like, you know, lawn care people, and it can be used on farms. Um, but that's one, one area they cited because those are known to kind of have negative impacts on bees. Um, I mean, I think also just planting, you know, pollinator gardens and so bees can have flowers to visit and stuff like that. But I mean, another, you know, another thing they attributed to the decline is climate change, not surprisingly. Um, so it's kind of a, yeah, it's a complicated issue, but I don't know. Any other questions? Okay. And I'll just talk quickly about, I realize I didn't include any energy slides, so here's <laughs> a couple about some of the stuff I do in the energy world. This is, how many of you are familiar with Vermont Yankee? Okay, so a lot of you. Um, so yeah, that was a nuclear power plant in Vernon, Vermont, it's in the far southern part of the state. It ran from 1972 to 2014, and, um, yeah, but just because they shut it down, it's a, this massive nuclear power plant, and there's obviously still nuclear waste there. So that's kind of pr was presenting a, frankly, a, a safe, a potential safety hazard. Um, so they, when you kind of take apart a nuclear power plant and eventually turn that site into other use, that's called decommissioning. So in 2019, the company that owned Vermont Yankee sold it to this group called North Star, which is actually a basically an industrial demolition company. Um, and they pretty quickly started taking it apart. My editor was like, you gotta get down there and see what's going on. And I was like, eh, they're not just gonna let me <laughs> wander into the <laughs> nuclear power site, but okay, I'll see what I can do. So I kept calling and calling their media person who was really friendly, but said sort of a similar thing, like, oh, we, you know, we have to schedule this far in advance. We can't just let people wander on the site, which is good. It's good that they have some obvious security down there. Um, so eventually, I did ask and pleaded <laughs> to get down, and eventually they did let me visit, and I actually was pretty happy because I figured at some point they'd have a press day down there, but I really wanted to go before that because I wanted to get, I don't know, you know, be able to ask more questions and not just have it feel like a staged press event. And so they actually invited me and then one other local reporter from Brattleboro who covered this a lot down for, they were taking down these 
cooling towers, which basically used to cool water used in reactions. Um, so that was cool because it was really dramatic. There were these huge cats that were taking them down. <laughs> um, obviously, we were far away, but I got to get some good pictures. Then also, I got to tour all around the plant and you know, kind of just learn more about how a nuclear power plant works, learn what the different parts were, learn kind of the steps of decommissioning. And um, I'd, earlier, I think like a month before I went down this summer, I'd attended a public meeting about the decommissioning. And this was the first time I'd covered anything nuclear power related because we used to have a guy on staff who had worked in Brattleboro for 20 years. And so he was like the Vermont Yankee expert and then he left. <laughs> and then I had to very quickly <laughs> learn about nuclear power. Um, so the first meeting I went to, I didn't really know a lot about what they were talking about, especially because they used tons of acronyms. So actually getting to go and tour the site was great um, and really helpful. So yeah, that's just an example of, like I said, all the other energy coverage I do is about what the state's electrical utilities are doing, about renewable energy development. Um, but that's kind of an example of a different story. Um, yeah, and so it's kind of my end slide. If you, I guess these are my like takeaway messages if you think you're interested in journalism or other kinds of writing. Um, learn to write well, and that will serve you for any, <laughs> any job you do, whether you're a scientist, you know, it just makes, a huge difference. Like I think if you're applying to jobs and you can write a good cover letter, um, you know, writing in my past life when I worked as a paralegal, I had to send tons of business emails. So it was important that, you know, I could, I don't know, structure them well and come off sounding professional. So really any job you have writing well is going to be crucial. Um, and then also, yeah, if you're more specifically interested in journalism, I'd really recommend writing for your school paper. Um, you know, take a journalism class if you can, write for a local paper. Um, also, you know, you could do some kind of an internship in, at a news outlet at radio over the summer because I think that, so a lot of people I work with don't actually didn't go to journalism school. So you definitely don't have to major in journalism or go to journalism school. But I think they all had written for their college papers, you know, and gotten a lot of experience that way and then did internships. And so that's kind of what enabled them to get that initial first job. I was kind of, I didn't really do that path, but the way I got that job at Vermont Digger was by having an internship. So, because journalism is something where people don't care that much about what you studied, they care how well you can write and report. And so you need to be able to show if, you're, if one was to go apply for a journalism job, you need to have what are called clips, so examples of your work, and that's how you get hired. And if you don't have that, you're not really gonna get hired. Um, so that's kind of, if you're interested in that at this stage, I'd highly recommend that. And then also journalism is not a nine to five job. It's also not predictable. I routinely have to work late, cover events in the evening, and sometimes these are things that I don't know about until a couple hours before, um, so I'm constantly it kind of has to be your number one priority. <laughs> um, but you know, having said that, I'm also, I'm someone who's outdoorsy, so I still have time to do fun stuff on weekends. I still go on runs, and it's not like that's my whole life, but you just have to be willing to be, I don't know, have a flexible schedule. And if you want a lot of predictability in your life and want to know when you're getting out of work every day, don't be a journalist, because <laughs> um, that's not what you're going to get. But yeah, and then also, you know, I really recommend like, just checking, you know, whether it's reading different local and national news, popular science magazines, journal articles, online outlets, just kind of get a flavor of, I don't know, different forms of news, also latest research. Like I, you know, I'm not exactly a science journalist, but I would say I'm, part of what I do is definitely science journalism. And so I, I try to keep tabs and like, you know, what's happening in the national environmental sphere? What's the latest environmental research going on? You know, we specifically, all our articles have to focus on Vermont, but sort of looking at what other journalists are doing, looking at, you know, research. I mean, I, I do especially say for the, my um, articles about PFAS contamination, I've looked through a lot of public health articles about PFAS because, you know, I want to be able to ask people in the state good, tough questions. And to be able to do that, I need to have kind of my own background scientific knowledge on this stuff so I can... I'm not saying this has exactly happened with PFAS, but for instance, if they said, you know, we want to set the drinking water health standard at this level. And I'd say, oh, but this state set it at a lower level. So why, you know, what makes you think that we should set it? So you, you have to kind of be 
you want to try to maybe know more than your sources, if you, <laughs> which isn't always possible because they're often experts. But yeah, so I, I try to do kind of some of my own research. So when I go and interview people, especially if it's going to be a tough interview, I can come in really prepared. Um, and then, yeah, also listening to, there's tons of really cool environmental and science podcasts out there. Um, you know, we have a podcast. So it's, I would say that's a medium that's like really getting a lot of growth and is really interesting. Also listening to public radio, um, watching documentaries, news stuff, just to get a flavor of the different kinds of, you know, journalism outlets out there and to be informed. Um, and also, like I said, you don't have to go to journalism school. I think I took an environmental journalism course in college, and I thought it was really interesting. And you know, I think it helped me maybe get this job. Um, so I think taking some, if you are, I don't, I don't. Do you guys have a you have a journalism program here? Okay. I think if you're interested, you know, trying to take a journalism class would be great. But I guess my point is that you don't you don't have to go to journalism school. I also know people who are really talented journalists who did go to journalism school. So I don't think there's anything wrong with doing it. But I think having, I would not have gotten my job as the energy and environment reporter had I not had my environmental studies degree, I think, um, because I also don't really have a background in journalism, but I was able to leverage kind of my knowledge of the subject into that job and really relied on that and said like, oh yeah, I've worked in the environmental field for years. I didn't, you know, <laughs> know all this stuff and that was how I got that position. So I think sometimes also, and especially in science journalism, there's a lot of people who are actually trained as scientists who later go into that. Um, but obviously they're good writers too. So yeah, those are sort of, you have to be both those things. But yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's the end. Thanks everyone. <laughs>
there was this national effort um, put on by the Columbia Journalism Review and then The Nation, which is a pretty well-known national publication. And they were basically trying to get media, whoops, media outlets like local and national to do more climate change coverage. So I thought, hey, we should participate in this. My editor said, great, um, what are your ideas for stories? And I was like, oh, I have a month to do, <laughs> to come up with and report five long stories about climate change. Um, so that was an interesting experience. And I, the first story I wrote about, I just focused on like, how is climate change impacting Vermont now? Because I think a lot of people, when they think about climate change, it's, I think it's often discussed in like, what could happen or what are, you know, what are predictions for the future? But the fact is like, we're, you know, we're seeing impacts now. So um, that was kind of, uh, and to do that, I looked at a lot of data about, you know, temperature changes, um, changes in snowfall, precipitation. So for my job, I end up, I do end up actually looking at a lot of, you know, government data and stuff like that. So it's, that's a big source for stories. Um, and then I also did another story for that about whether Vermont could see you know, people basically climate related migration um, because there's some some planners in the state have been, especially in southern Vermont, were kind of wondering if city if New England cities experience more flooding and storms, are people going to want to you know leave, move out of there? And if so, where would they go? Um, and I and I met a couple people who had actually moved from out west because of wildfire smoke contamination, and you know they were looking. I think these were people who were interested in moving to Vermont anyway, but they really cited wildfires, you know, increased wildfire smoke as a driving factor to move there. So that was kind of an interesting, different story that I worked on. Um, so let me, actually another story I'm working on now, I just got back a bunch of data I requested about solar installation in Vermont, because um, I want to do a story about just the growth of the solar industry. And that's something I covered a lot on kind of a, a one-off basis, you know, like maybe, for instance, I covered, um, this kind of controversial solar farm in Bennington where some residents who live nearby you know, don't want it. It's this big developer from New York who's doing it. But I just wanted to do more of an overall look at how, you know, how has the solar industry grown? What are some challenges it's facing? Um, so that's kind of a, a story I'm working on that I'm excited about, I guess. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Yes, Hannah. When do you uh, take a position uh, an issue to influence public uh, perception of it? That's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, because I think there's this idea, well, it's, it's more than an idea. It's like an ethos of journalists is you want to, you know, you want to try to be as unbiased as possible. And so I'm always trying to question myself, like, what is my personal opinion of this? And how do I make sure that that it's not that I think it's impossible to make yourself be totally unbiased, <laughs> but how can I at least you know at least be aware of that and how it might be impacting my reporting? But I think things like the I think what I care about more in my reporting is like how much should the public be aware of this? And it's not necessarily whether like okay, for instance, for the Coventry landfill expansion, it's not that I supported or opposed the landfill expansion, but I did support, I thought it's something that people should know about and people should know about it outside of just the Northeast Kingdom. Um, so I kind of made the decision. I was the first statewide reporter to cover that issue and I covered it pretty aggressively and eventually seven days in VPR <laughs> also covered it. But yes, yeah, so that was something where I'd, I, I really try not to like take a position on an issue, but I think rather, I think in deciding what warrants coverage you're sort of at least saying like hey this is something people should pay attention to and an area where um i did probably get the most negative i got a lot of positive feedback but also got some negative emails was about my climate change series because i got emails from people saying you know that climate change wasn't real that i was manipulating data that <laughs> caring about the state's greenhouse gas emission goals was some kind of pet project <laughs> of mine, even though, because the last story I wrote for that series had to do with how Vermont were not meeting our targets for emissions reductions. So someone emailed me after basically saying that that was like my pet project. And I was like, well, it's laid out in statute. <laughs> but I don't know. It's not just like something that I made up. But you know, um, I don't know if that answered the question. But yeah. I was wondering if you really if you wanted to sway public Issues that you care about. Yeah. Why don't you do that for us? Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, frankly, I think one issue 
where I would say I guess I've done that is climate change. Like by by signing us up to participate in this covering week of covering climate change, you know, I was kind of saying like this is something people should be caring about and should be aware of. Um, and you know, I think another similar thing that I've covered a lot is. Uh, pollution of Lake Champlain and runoff issues and issues with cyanobacteria blooms and yeah I think that's something I do think that's a problem <laughs> um, you know and same with the, the PFOA contamination issue like part of the reason I went down to Bennington and covered that in the legislature a lot is because I, I just wanted to make sure like the focus wasn't lost on on that community and yeah so I guess I think things I really care about personally are if there's a potential for a public health impact. Um, and especially if it's something that, you know, like, yeah, like with the landfill expansion, that's a part of the state that's, you know, one of the poorest parts of the state. It doesn't necessarily get a lot of attention. So that's something that I really thought, like, hey, this could use a lot of Vermont Digger <laughs> stories about it. Um, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, great question. Yeah, so we cover um, all kinds of stuff. We cover a lot of political news. So we have a person who's, you know, I cover some environmental political stories, but he'll cover more general stories, you know, like what's the governor up to. Um, some of the big debates in the legislature over paid family leave, minimum wage. So we definitely, I think more, far more than any other outlet in the state, we really cover what's going on in the state house and with state government agencies. So we have a woman who's an education reporter. So you know she covers school systems, agency of education. We have a healthcare reporter, a business reporter, um, a couple of people who are what's called general assignment. So they kind of, and that's what I did when I was an intern there. You basically just, you never know what you're doing any day. You could be doing a crime story. You could be doing, who knows? Um, so they just kind of do whatever we need <laughs> help with. We also have a guy who's a, a really experienced criminal justice reporter. So you know he's always going to courts, um, covering cases. Yeah, so a pretty broad range of stuff. But I think really with a kind of a political statewide focus. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> Canada again. What's your uh, coverage of Vermont Diggers coverage been with? NVU's merger. It's <laughs> a good question. Um, I'm not that knowledgeable about our education coverage. I think we. I mean, I know we covered the plan a little bit, but I don't feel like we've covered that a ton. I know our education reporter, not so much anymore, but at least last year she covered tons of stuff with the Act 46 and school mergers. That was like a big, you know, controversy um, ongoing, but. Yeah, I, don't, I guess I don't know how much we've covered of that, to be honest. I know she's covered also some of the, the smaller colleges in the state, like Green Mountain College, College of St. Joseph's, which have either gone out of business or are really struggling a lot to make ends meet. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever gotten a chance, sorry, I'm Sarah. Hey, Sarah. Have you ever gotten a chance to go on to Vermont Edition? I've certainly heard multiple journalists. Yeah, um, I actually have not been on Vermont Edition. I did go on Vermont This Week, which is a weekly, it's on PBS, and it's like a talk show with reporters. So that was kind of exciting. I got to have like, there was like a makeup artist, and <laughs> it was, you know, like a really big light, and um, that was fun. So that's something that's kind of fun about this job, too, is you get, invited to do. I go on um, this radio show sometimes in the morning and yeah, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, any other questions about journalism or? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you edit your work? Like, what is it that you do? What is, what is the process that you do? Yeah, use? that's a good question. Um, so I, let's see. Once I do interviews, it's it's a little bit of a scattered process because a lot of my job is if I'm like covering a specific event or a meeting, it's kind of more clear cut because it's like, okay, I'm going to this thing. You know, maybe I try to talk to some people after, do a little research, then I write a story. Um, a lot of times, what I do if I'm calling people, I never know who's going to call me back, when they're going to call me back. Um, so I'm really like at the mercy of, you know, as soon as my phone rings, like run over <laughs> to it and answer them and grab a notebook. Um, 
Well, that sounds something that is a little bit intense about being a journalist, I guess. <laughs> but your like your work is is in a lot of ways dependent on other people kind of getting back to you. Um, and let's see. So I'll, I'll write up articles, and then I we do everything. We use Google Drive, so I will upload my article, and then an editor reads it. Like I am not allowed to post stuff on our site. <laughs> Reporters aren't really allowed to do that, which is good because you you know you want to have an editor look through it, and then sometimes they'll call you back with questions about stuff. Um, sometimes they won't, and they'll just make out of it if they're minor, but they try to get back in touch with you if there's anything major to make sure there's you know no mistakes um, that they're making. And yeah, then it gets posted online. We post a lot of articles at night just because we like, we'll like submit them like late afternoon, early evening, and then they're edited. Um, and obviously, we're an online only outlet. So that's I think that's both good and bad, because I think people who work at actual like, newspapers usually have a lot harder cutoffs, which I think is more stressful, but also makes it so you're not working as late, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, that's kind of what the editing process is like. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, thank you very much. OK, thanks.